I'm delighted to welcome everyone to our webinar today. Uh, I'm Kerry Kalanisi, the director of the Penn Program on Regulation at the University of Pennsylvania. And we're uh, pleased that you can join us for our session on behavioral insights, public consultation, and regulatory policy perspectives from Europe. We have uh, two extraordinary experts to uh, have a conversation with and learn from today. And it's my pleasure to introduce them in a moment to you. Uh, I do wanna, at the outset, uh, let everyone know that uh, this session is being recorded and uh, will be made available later on the Penn Program on Regulations YouTube channel. Uh, I also encourage uh, anybody participating to submit questions for the panel members uh, and for discussion later. You can do that by using the Q&A button down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, I'll be monitoring those questions that come in and we'll pose as many of them as I possibly can uh, to the panel members uh, during the discussion portion of today's program. That program uh, is uh, uh, organized around a new paper by our featured speaker, uh, Professor Nicoletta Rangone, who is a, a professor of administrative law at Lumsa University. She's also a professor of better regulation in the European Master of Law and Economics program uh, and the Jean Monnet Chair on EU Approach to Better Regulation. Uh, she's someone who has worked for national and international institutions on regulatory reforms, uh, the OECD, the World Bank, the Italian Authority for Energy, the Corruption Prevention Authority, Ministry for Public Education, and many others. Uh, prior to entering academe, she worked at the Italian Competition Authority. And she's going to talk today in the main presentation about her new paper uh, entitled Improving Consultation to Ensure the European Union's Democratic Legitimacy from Traditional Procedural Requirements to Behavioral Insights. This is a paper just recently released in the European Law Journal, and I highly recommend it to you. Uh, following uh, Professor Rangone's uh, presentation, we will hear from uh, some commentary from Christiana Arndt Boskel, who uh, leads the OECD's Regulatory Policy Outlook and the OECD Program on Measuring Regulatory Performance, in which she works on uh, developing cross-country comparative indicators uh, on uh, the matters of domestic regulatory policy and evaluation. Uh, before uh, joining the Public Governance Directorate at the OECD, she worked at the OECD's Development Center, also at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and for the World Bank on measuring governance and its economic impact. Dr. Arndt has widely published in uh, academe and at the OECD on a variety of issues related to policy evaluation, performance indicators, behavioral sciences, trust in government, and public participation. We're delighted to have uh, both uh, 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 Professor Rangoni and Dr. Arndt with us uh, today. And I'd like to open it up, allow them to have uh, some opening remarks, and then we'll have a little bit of a conversation and we'll then take your questions uh, from the audience. And we'll look forward to uh, spending the next hour learning about uh, the importance of strengthening and making more meaningful the role of public consultation in uh, the regulatory process. As a way of introducing uh, Professor Rangoni and her presentation, I just wanted to take a moment to quote from uh, the conclusion of uh, her recent article, in which she says that consultation is widely recognized as a means to ensure transparency and participation while reducing the risks of rent-seeking, regulatory capture, and corruption. By bringing together stakeholders and public authorities in rulemaking, consultation also improves regulation, enhances its acceptance, and helps in rebuilding public trust. 
But she also argues that that consultation has to be, quote, genuine and, quote, real. And that's what we're here to talk about today, how to make it genuine, how to make it real, to have meaningful participation and, and uh, input into improving uh, regulatory decisions. Uh, with that, uh, let me turn things over to Professor Rangone. Thank you, Professor Koyanisi, for the honor of speaking at this webinar and for having me at UPenn. And I also thank all the Penn program staff for its outstanding daily work. Let me share my screen. Okay, so you already uh, summarized this uh, slide. I would like to, to add uh, one important thing, is that uh, this year, the conference on, on the future of Europe uh, has come to an end after 12 years, 12 months, sorry, of debate among European citizens. Several recommendations coming from the conference do call for more regular and depth citizens' involvement. This is why it's all the more crucial nowadays to question whether consultation are effective in democratizing regulation. So in theory, consultation is an effective tool to support public authorities' legitimation, increase the quality of regulation, and enhance trust and compliance. However, consultation is not a magic formula to reach all these targets. Otherwise, in this slide, you can see a magic formula engraved in the door of a villa in Rome. So in the real world, uh, uh, consultation can backfire, leading to numerous detrimental consequences for rulemakers and the whole society. All these consequences are well documented in the OECD regulatory uh, policy outlook. My point is that if you want to engage real people and get the best available input, we need to know them. Is it utopic? Well, cognitive science uh, provides experimental methods to collect fine-tuned information about people and regulators, actually make choices and react to a given stimuli. Uh, this is not new. However, quite paradoxically, uh, the last edition of the Better Regulation Toolbox does not even mention the relevance of cognitive insight into consultation. Even more surprisingly, Cognitive insights are qualified as emerging methods for better regulation, along with sandboxes. And these happen more than 40 years after Eber Simon received the Nobel Prize for his studies on bounded rationality. So what are the main take-home messages to be drawn from behavioral approach to consultation? I'll focus on the way to improve accessibility to the process and to accessibility to the document. And I refer to this paper for further analysis of bias that can lead consultation to fail and possible solutions. So uh, actual debate on consultation is concentrated on how to improve weak interest engagement. I will focus on citizens. Citizen participation is limited everywhere due to motivational knowledge, to motivational and knowledge-based obstacles. And these obstacles are emphasized, of course, in technical analysis such as impact assessment. So a prerequisite for engagement is to be sure that missing stakeholders are aware of the very existence of a consultation and of the participation opportunities. All channels potentially adequate to reach them should therefore be activated. Social media, radio, web, face-to-face, -face, press, this is not new. 
However, some very common bias can actually play a role in preventing missed stakeholders from participating. For instance, inertia bias and loss aversion may hinder citizen engagement because participation requires an immediate outlay for future and unsure advantages. What practical solution? In order to nudge participation, a comparative feedback can be provided, for instance, by signaling to comparable order who have already answered a questionnaire or sent position. Otherwise, a uh, make it easy approach is an example of cognitive empowerment, which is indeed try to help people in overcoming bias differently from nudging that leverage on bias. So make it easy approach include consultation website standardization or single access point, provided that this is not a, a set of links to different website only. Another way to help people in overcoming inertia is to provide diverse consultation techniques to cluster stakeholders. Some have, have been experienced at EU level and national level, for instance, online forums, citizen dialogues, interactive websites. However, how cluster stakeholders should be identified is an open question. And this same question is crucial also to ensure the accessibility to consultation document. Indeed, the standard narrative for rulemakers increases the power of inertia and information overload, and those bias can stop citizens approaching documents which are too long and complicated. In order to avoid this outcome, the Make It Easy approach include questionnaires which are tailored to different stakeholders. How should this weak interest be identified? Well, a precise uh, stakeholder mapping is crucial for weak interest engagement. However, it's not easy to figure out realistic clusters. For instance, can we assume all citizens have same skills, knowledge, and interest in the issue at stake? So the mapping activity is a sensitive, difficult, and time-consuming task, to the point that one can question whether this analysis is actually always carried out, even if the European toolbox provide a detailed methodology. But this remains a speculative question since the mapping activities is not traced by the European Commission. One piece of good news is that AI can support rulemakers in the identification of cluster groups by means of NLP, topic modeling, and sentiment analysis. In this regard, I refer to a contribution just published in the regulatory review by Fabiana Di Porto. Having identified click stakeholder clusters, then they should be addressed to different uh, diverse uh, narratives. So this, to this aim, consultation document can be divided in two parts or different questionnaire for different consultation target can be provided. A third option, which characterizes almost every consultation launched at, by the European Commission is to open all processes to citizens, even the most technical ones, and exempt citizens from filling in some paragraph. This approach makes the whole document long and complicated to the point that information overload could prevent citizens from assessing it or from providing con valuable contribution. And the slide gives you an example of this approach and of the standard narrative of rulemakers. Gatekeeper roles and platform ecosystem are certainly not expression familiar to citizens. I refer to the background paper in order to provide more examples that, uh, that can lead consultation to fail. 
But this scenario is complicated by rule makers not being immune to bias. Inertia, loss aversion, confirmation bias may lead to bias decisions. I refer once again to the paper for the description of possible solution. Let me just point out a very sensitive issue related to confirmation bias. When shall consultation be organized? Early stage consultation can balance public authorities' confirmation bias but at the same time can expose a citizen to a choice overload. However, late stage consultation does not allow citizens to provide their point of view if they are tuned in a document that has been already organized in articles. This is another open question. Here I would like to focus on information overload. This is perhaps the most relevant bias. The risk being that public authorities are overwhelmed by comments, focusing on reading and answering them, and therefore losing the core information provided. Addressing this bias is all the more important because its consequences may feed the position of those who claim that rule makers should not take into consideration opinions without elaboration. Another piece of good news is that artificial intelligence can support rule makers in this further step. AI helps in neutralizing the information overload by supporting humans in performing that task of reorganizing and analyzing comments received. However, an unduly design of the algorithm can alter the quality of information available to rule makers to the point of compromising the guarantees of participation. So to conclude, uh, uh, cognitive insight and artificial intelligence are perhaps not definitive solution in improving consultation, but can be considered new tools in the better regulation toolbox. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Rangone. Uh, we're so delighted to have you share this important work with us and to be spending some time with us here at the Penn Program on Regulation as a visiting scholar. And we're looking forward to discussing further uh, these ideas that you've set out so well here for us today. Before we turn to questions and discussion of your presentation, I'd like to invite uh, Christiane, Christiana to uh, share with us uh, some of the work that the OECD has been doing uh, with respect to public consultation, uh, maybe also on behavioral insights and, and public trust as well. Uh, so, uh, Christiana? Yeah, many thanks, Carrie, and many thanks, Nicoletta, for an incredibly relevant paper. Uh, I must say, I think it's very inspiring, and it is relevant beyond the Europe, beyond the European Commission and the European Union. So, I think also for those who are interested in this area uh, in in other countries, there are a lot of ideas in there that can be picked up. Um, you say in your paper already in the beginning that it looks like that you say uh, the European Commission has a more sophisticated system, and not just in consultation, but also in RIA and ex post evaluation. Uh, we can see that uh, in our indicators of regulatory policy and government, um, which are published regularly every three years. And it's particularly striking for ex post evaluation. So you can find that in the regulatory policy outlook and the better regulation practices report that we recently published. Now that does not at all mean that their system is perfect. We always say that while well, everything that is in the indicators matters, not everything that matters is in the indicators. So good practices of the EC, there might be some good practices that are not in there, but there might also be areas uh, that need to be improved, including in the area of uh, using cognitive insights that might not be in there. So the elements that are covered in there, and some of them relate to what you're saying, um, are issues around requirements and practice around the frequency of consultation, the timing, is this actually done uh, both early enough um, to actually um, still be open to alternatives to proposed regulation and late as well to discuss the details of the drafts. 
whether anyone can participate, so how open it is, what's the transparency around it. So for instance, is there information later on, on um, uh, what participants said? Are there any explanations? Are there, is it easy to know about it? Are there announcements in advance? Is there a single website, um, et cetera? Now, what we have not done uh, is to go into depth as we cover a lot of countries. We cover all OECD countries, all EU countries. So this is something we usually do in in-depth country reviews, which we have not done for the EU. Obviously, if we ask, we would be very keen to do that. Um, on consultation in particular, there is a report of the audit office, where also was part of, of the expert panel, which might also be relevant uh, in that respect, which is from 2019. So. Uh, what I cannot do is provide an in-depth assessment of the EC system, but as Carrie said, I can more generally maybe comment on, on the work we do on consultation systems. We have best practices principles, um, which are only in draft formats, because uh, our member countries actually could not agree on some elements in it. So this also shows that there's not always full consensus what good practice actually is in the area of consultation. I can just fully agree to take a behavioral science perspective. I mean, basically in some way, this always sounds complicated behavioral science, but in the end, it's just about how do human beings actually function in practice and not just in, in, in theory. And that's always important to make sure that regulatory management tools are actually working. Um, some relevant work I can maybe point to in this respect is I've done uh, some years ago a paper with Ellen Lind, who is an expert from Duke University on behavioral science and perspective fairness from, and we have published uh, that article together in the regulatory reform, uh, regulatory review, and it emphasizes the elements of voice, lack of bias, respect, and explanations to ensure that citizens actually perceive government processes as fair. And perceived fairness sounds a bit abstract, but this is an important driver of trust in government and feeling included. And we all know that one of the reasons for uh, the crisis of democracy is also that people are feeling excluded. So this is incredibly important. And there's a clear link to what is in that paper to the paper that Nicoletta presented. Uh, there are some elements in there in how taking into account cognitive insights can improve uh, consultation process. And that includes, for instance, to make sure what is done with, with feedback. Uh, it also shows how easy it actually is to measure perceived fairness. And that might be something maybe we'll pick, up, pick that up later. It's important to see whether um, taking in a more uh, taking a behavioral science perspective actually leads us to better results or not. Now, I would also like to point to the work uh, that's done in general on the OECD on behavioral insights. My colleague, Jamin Strummond leads that. Um, we have been applying BI to regulatory policy um, since 2013, including by applications to policies as well as organizations, firms, and even policy makers themselves. And while we focused a lot more on the actual regulations in the past, uh, we are planning to do a lot more and have already started doing that um, to, uh, to focusing a lot more on applying BI to the institutions, processes and tools of regulatory policy making. And there's a paper that might be relevant for the audience interested in this, which was written by James, but also by our current acting head of division, Daniel Trenka and, uh, and Daniel Shepard, which is called Behavioral Insights and Regulatory Governance Opportunities and Challenges. Maybe I can just highlight a few points from that paper, which are particularly relevant here. I think it, it basically uh, emphasizes, as Nicoletta has done, that those processes, they can fail. And it even says very clearly also in, our, in the regulatory policy outlook, where we also have um, put in a summary of the findings in there, is that uh, biases and barriers are in part responsible for regulatory management tools failing to reach their intended targets despite 30 years of development. And the paper notes four ways behavior could be af uh, affecting the efficiencies uh, of regulatory management tools, including stakeholder engagement based on what we call the OECD's basic framework for analyzing behavioral issues. And these include first kind of ABC. So the first one is attention, limited capacity and present focus due to high workloads and fast paced decision making situations. Two is beliefs, focus on data that confirms priors and overweighting of potential negatives. Three, choice, risk of groupthink amongst like-minded analysis, analysts and resistance to change from current ways of working. And fourth, determination. As also Nicoletta mentioned, assumption others do not use the tools or do so superficially and potentially reduce sense of autonomy leading to less effort to use the tools. So all of these elements 
might also help to uh, to enrich this debate. And the paper already gives some ideas on how they can be addressed. It doesn't just talk about the challenges, but also about ways to, to address them. Uh, a few final points I would like to make is about Nicoletta, I think very rightly talks about uh, who actually participates and how easy it is to participate. A point I find very important is that we should not mix up consultation with direct democracy it's not a way of making people vote and this is also how results should not be presented we shouldn't say that percentage of uh, participants thinks this and this is why we're doing this now i don't think we can use consultation as such to justify decision it's a way about finding and collecting information on impacts and of, of the practical ways planned regulation would impact people to get more ideas about potential alternative situations and to make sure that those affected actually have that possibility to say something, even if um, this was not considered uh, before, so that people don't feel so helpless that they actually have that possibility to reach the government and the government can think about it. Oh, okay, we haven't thought about that. Uh, so let us, let us maybe modify the proposal accordingly. Um, I think the idea to just justify decision on the percentage of participants um, can also lead to biased decisions. Um, even and potentially even if, uh, if if we have statistically representative opinion polls, I mean, depending on uh, what the law is for, if it's for instance my, for minorities, etc., this again is not necessarily the basis uh, for decision making. So uh, on that is also important. Uh, so, so again, here it's important to, and I fully agree with Nicoletta, to proactively engage relevant stakeholders and particularly those groups that do not have the time or resources to participate, to th think about how their views can be sought out, whether the, the laws uh, and uh, the planned laws or regulations can actually work out in practice. Now, very fully agree consultation questions can also be biased. And uh, this sounds very obvious, but actually designing non-biased questions is not so easy to do. So I think, again, that's an area for providing guidance to policymakers. If you want to have a little bit of fun, there is a, a video I really love from, uh, you can just find it on YouTube, uh, on, from Yes Prime Minister, if you type in leading questions. It's a very old uh, short clip, but it's still very up to date on how easy it is actually to get people to answer certain things in a way that, that you want them to, to answer them. What I also really like and have come across quite a bit in the past are citizens panels. The OECD has also done some work on that, uh, which is a really nice way for people to understand how complex policy problems can be. And I've heard a lot of feedback from these panels that people come in as they usually come in, everyone thinks, okay, government should be doing this. This is what I want. And then they realize, hmm, the others actually want something else. And this is actually quite complicated. But it's a good way, I think, of, of, of realizing this and a good basis also for, for, uh, for democracy so that people are aware of how complex these decision-making processes are actually, and that it's not always that easy for policymakers as well. Now, as a final point, I really love the idea as uh, that's written in the paper to involve uh, young people more. Uh, OECD is already doing a bit of work in that field. My colleague Miriam Alam, uh, for instance, has founded the, the Youth Forum. And uh, yes, I think that's very important and picks up again to the point also to make sure to, to reach out to the, rele to the relevant audiences. Thank you very much, Christiana. This is uh, terrific. And I would invite Nicoletta now to uh, come on back and join us and uh, give you an opportunity, uh, uh, Nicoletta, if you have anything you'd like to respond to that Christiana has said. I mean, at, 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 if nothing else, I, I wondered if you would agree with her opening comment that what you are um, talking about in your paper and what you've shared in your presentation has applicability well beyond the European Commission. Thank you, Carrie. Yes, an immediate reaction. I would like to underline the, the, the relevance of the procedural fairness that uh, Christian mentioned and uh, about which uh, she has written uh, deeply, uh, because this is a very real, really a turning point for uh, uh, public administration, not just consultation. So the idea to uh, uh, to have a public administration which is supportive and cooperative 
it's a turning point for improving uh, uh, compliance, trust, uh, and to um, to reduce uh, the need to, to of uh, public enforcement. So this is really, really relevant, not just for consultation. It's obvious, but it's always important to underline obvious things. And uh, another point uh, that uh, I didn't make uh, clear, but is obvious uh, that uh, in order to uh, implement cognitive based cons consultation, of course, uh, there is a need uh, of uh, reorganization of the public, uh, public sector and of the activities of public sector. I mean, I, I always uh, uh, remember um, a great executive order from the Obama administration who um, suggest to recruit behavioral scientists in the federal agencies. And this is the point, to have experts in the administration, not just in a devoted in unit, a unit devoted to a behavioral approach. And the second point is that the use of a behavioral approach, a behavioral so behavioral tested initiative using the words of the European Commission, not just behavioral inform or align in each certif, need time and is costly because to perform an experiment, you need the expert and you need time to perform it. And this is to be added to the time frame uh, that must be respect for delivering a regulation. So this is not something <laughs> easy to, to do. Uh, this is my remark. Thank you very much. And let me invite members of the audience to pose a question in the Q&A uh, function. Uh, and we will try to get to as many of the, your questions as we can. I, I, just to build, Nicoletta, on your last point, and this is a question both for you and Christiana. Given the possibility and maybe the likelihood of confirmation bias by the regulators themselves, even before you, they go out for public consultation, they have an idea of what the problem might be, what what their probably preferred solution is even to it, um, where one would hope uh, you know, the, a meaningful public consultation process would have regulators being open-minded, maybe even being open to seeing the problem in a different way than they're currently seeing it, and certainly being open to different solutions. But um, given that kind of conf really strong, I think, potential for confirmation bias in the way that the regulator frames questions, as you talk about in your paper, Nicoletta, uh, being important, do you think there's any value to having uh, some kind of distance uh, or independence between those within a regulatory authority that are running a public consultation process and those that are actually involved in writing the rules. Now, obviously it can't be totally separate. It shouldn't be totally separate because you want the, the, the people writing the rules are gonna know what they what you know what the rule is about and, and, and what kinds of questions to ask and who might be uh, interested, but on the other hand, they might be also very much invested in their own uh, viewpoint. So in, in coming up with these and running the, a public consultation process, can you talk about what might be the role for some kind of independent or neutral uh, thir either third party, a consultant, or maybe within the regulatory agency, a different office? And I, and I, and I would just also sort of ask, in some sense, the same question, Nicoletta, about the experiments that you're talking about as well. Who's um, who's actually doing that? Uh, the same folks who are writing the regulations, will they be more inclined to say, oh, this experiment was a success because it yielded um, you know, no input. So maybe that means we are doing the right thing uh, or, uh, you know, anyway, it, it, it's, it's a possibility that there's a spillover between uh, the substantive work on a regulation and the evaluation of the of the process, perhaps as well. Uh, would would either of you like to comment on that? Nicoletta, we could start I, with you. Yeah, yes, yes, sure. 
yes, this is the, the idea to have some uh, someone who is independent by the regulator who organize consultation, perform consultation, perhaps uh, is not uh, uh, feasible, but uh, I'm convinced that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, to draft a consultation document, it, is, it needs uh, some skills, technical skills, and uh, if you want to agree with uh, our idea today to have a cognitive-based consultation, also be, be a behavioral scientist may, must be involved. I, I don't. I, I think that uh, this type of uh, uh, skill must uh, be spread in the administration. I don't trust uh, in the um, that uh, the intervention of uh, a consultant or uh, a devoted unit is really uh, helpful because the. Um, this new idea must be also understood by people, civil servant, with more which have, have more traditional skill. So the need to work together, people with different background, is really important for cognitive-based consultations, uh, and uh, the same is for impact assessment, as we know very well. So I will suggest to have uh, uh, technicians, behavioral scientists, people very uh, with a good knowledge on how to draft uh, questions in a neutral way. But of course, they depend from the um, regulators, so they cannot be completely independent and nor perhaps uh, neutral. But uh, I would like to give the floor to Christian to react to this point. Yeah, I think many thanks. Um, I, I fully agree. I think it's very important to have support because I think in many cases regulators might want to do this well, but they may not always know how to. So there need to be support units and it depends on the systems and countries how that's organized. It's also important to have oversight of the process. So to make sure that the oversight body does not only look into RIA, does not only look into whether burdens have been measured well, but also looks into whether the consultation processes uh, have been done well and whether there's uh, at least compliance with the, with the requirements. Related to that is the importance to actually evaluate in general the effectiveness of the consultation processes, And that's something, unfortunately, we don't see is happening that frequently. Uh, in, currently, we've seen in the last years, only nine countries and the EU have recently published an evaluation of their consultation system. So that's not a lot in, in, in the OECD context. Uh, seven have data on compliance with consultation requirements or guidelines, and only three countries have done some type of perception indicator on the performance of consultations here. Relevant, for instance, here with the European Court of Auditors did where they actually interviewed those citizens who participated in consultations and also asked them for suggestions for improvement. Again, here also important to look uh, into data. I think Nicoletta also mentioned in their paper, her paper the importance of actually explaining what happened with the comments. And that's also something we can look into. Obviously, uh, regulators do not have to change their proposal based on what comes out of the consultation process, but if they never do it, that's an indication that consultation processes might be done just in a performa way. So to collect information on that, having a look into those documents and seeing what regulate, if regulators already have to explain what they have to do with the consultation comments, that's already a very nice basis then to see if from time to time, at least some of those comments find their way into changes uh, of, of the proposals. Now, even regulators and people sitting in ministries are constrained very often, the, if, for instance, coalition agreements, they already have the solution in there. So they don't really have a lot of room for maneuver. There was already an agreement what should happen. Um, so one of the questions we're asking ourselves as well is, is regulatory management, do regulatory management tools, uh, when, when should they be applied? Yeah. Is it enough? Maybe it's too late where they're currently applied. Maybe in some cases it's already parties uh, who should use regulatory management tools or should rely on, for instance, results of exposed evaluations, et cetera, to inform the party programs that they are drawing up and that this information then can also, also find their way in negotiations of coalitions, for instance. 
Uh, on that point, I want to share one comment that came in uh, on the Q and A function. It's more of a comment than a question, but um, the 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 audience member points out the importance of setting the right expectations about citizen engagement. Uh, and and I'm just reading here from the commenter. People tend to be discouraged to participate in a consultation if they think their contributions are not taken up by the administration. So maybe we should be clear from the beginning as to what the role of consultation is, especially if it is not going to be a referendum, uh, or especially if there's only a limited range of solutions that are already predetermined. Uh, that's that's an important point. Uh, another question, a question that came in from another audience uh, member, and it follows on this point about independence in uh, uh, evaluation. Uh, the question is, you know, uh, whether there should be um, judicial review of public consultation. Uh, is there this this uh, member of the audience asked actually a view of the European Commission at all about judicial review of the public consultation process itself? And if there were to be, uh, you know, how would courts, uh, or, or quite frankly, how do even government officials in the agencies know whether they have bias or, uh, you know, what counts as a strongly held view that would uh, lead to some bias? Uh, so this is a problem both within the agencies for regulatory management, but also would be a, a challenge for courts if they were to oversee the public consultation process. There's lots of questions over the years about whether the court should oversee RIA and an agency's benefit cost analysis and so forth and the adequacy of the evidence it puts forward. Um, other than maybe bare bones compliance with a minimal level of procedure, uh, is there any any further role for the courts to oversee the adequacy of public consultation? This is a very, very complicated question. I mean, there is no a unique answer. I mean, in administrative law countries, of course, uh, if uh, uh, the law asks for a consultative proceeding, uh, the lack of consultation or the lack of adequate consultation uh, may result uh, in, um, in a problem of the legitimacy of the regulation adopted. But the point is more sophisticated, the, the point raised by the uh, by the question, so how to uh, evaluate uh, whether uh, the, or, uh, the consultation or the public authorities are biased? Uh, I think this this is we cannot uh, uh, expect uh, uh, the court solve the problem. So whenever. Uh, uh, a regulation goes to court, in my opinion, is, is, a, is anyhow a failure because uh, we have to prevent this outcome that is already um, too often the case in, 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 me in some member states. So uh, it's very difficult for, um, at European level, uh, uh, the question mentioned, um, I think also impact assessment. Uh, what I know about um, the, the review of the court uh, of the impact assessment is that uh, uh, very often impact assessment is uh, taken as a background support, as a material in support uh, the, of the position of the European Commission or against if uh, the, um, the data collected are not enough. Uh, so impact assessment has been not really challenged in their uh, depth or uh, uh, quality by the, by the courts. Another, another uh, comment or question actually from the audience. Uh, and I wondered if, if uh, Christiana or, or Nicoletta, either of you have, have thoughts about this. What about promoting early consultation? and the use of 
uh, you know, uh, an early roadmap for uh, uh, an agency to release uh, to be able to engage the public at an early stage in the rulemaking process, wouldn't that avoid some of the biases that are more common when uh, the policy has already been formulated? Yeah, happy to comment on that. Um, this is actually a core element of, of our indicators and of our work on, on consultation is to recommend to have a two-stage process. So to, both stages are important. You want to consult early on because that's the stage where you're still open for alternatives. That should be ideally the stage where the decision to regulate has not been taken yet. Where there's a real discussion of what the options are because the regulation may not be the best option and the policymakers may not necessarily have come up with all alternative ideas so that's a very good stage i think to involve uh, uh, to involve uh, the, the general public also specifically stakeholders who who know about the topic uh, and then the the second stage to just consult on draft of the actual draft is also important because we all know the devil sometimes is in, in, the, in, in the detail. So it's also important then to have a discussion about this. Now, obviously we're not saying it's feasible to have a public consultation at both stages for everything. There can be some proportionality principle which is applied that for major initiatives, this is important to have a, a public pr uh, process at, at both stages. I just wanted to add something on the comment on, on the expectation management. I think this is incredibly important is to manage expectations to explain the process, what can be expected and can, what cannot be. But also, and we're not seeing that in all OECD countries, is to make sure that there's an explanation of what happened with the comments. Because that's also in the paper with, uh, with Ellen Lind, in, uh, which you can also find in the regulatory review, there is the, the, it can happen that people actually had an impact on the final decision, but they don't know about it. <laughs> And so they're actually disappointed with their, they're happy with the outcome, but they're still unhappy with the authorities because they think they did not have any impact on it. And it can be the other way around and actually even more important that research actually shows that even if the outcome is not what people expected it to be or wanted it to be, if it's explained to them how their input was taken into account and why in the end this does not make it into the final, uh, into the final draft, then people have the feeling, okay, at least I have a voice. Someone listens to me. I have an explanation now. I, I know why, but I was listened to. And that's incredibly important. And I think that phase is often neglected and there really should be a big investment in that phase. Now, obviously, again, countries which really consult to know something, they might have more incentives to go into that phase than uh, if, if there's never any change, it will be a bit of a problem to all the time <laughs> explain we never had to change anything. Yes, I completely agree with Christian. I would like to, to come back to the, the, the question concerning the early stage consultation. Uh, underline that uh, there is a, um, a new approach uh, adopted by the Van der Leyen Commission uh, in order to reduce the consultation fatigue. That it's uh, perhaps uh, uh, not not the best in, in order to uh, involve uh, citizens. I mean, because uh, in order to uh, simplify consultation, the idea is to have a, a single call for evidence. And that, that call for evidence bring together the previous consultation on roadmap, inception impact assessment, and open consultation based on questionnaires. So that's good for uh, reducing consultation fatigue, but at the same time, it must create problems. So we don't know yet at which, po at which point the consultation will be organized at the European level. But uh, here there is a trade-off between the need uh, to reduce uh, fatigue, but to involve uh, people in, uh, in the, at the right moment, I mean. <laughs> Thank you. And I, th I do, you know, this came up a lot in the negotiations on TTIP uh, about regulatory policy with uh, representatives from the US really pushing for uh, a more exacting and complete and, and, and in some sense, almost final looking proposed regulation for the public to comment on, uh, which the argument was, how can we have meaningful comment if we really don't see exactly what 
you're planning to do. And that makes some sense. On the other hand, for the very kind of biases that you're talking about, by that point in time, if the agency has put together something that's well specified, uh, they're likely to be more committed to it, right? So uh, the two-stage process, uh, Christiana, that you mentioned, uh, and this uh, the, the idea, as Nicoletta says, of early consultation, good, maybe it needs to be supplemented, as you say, with, uh, with that second stage as well. In thinking about these permutations, early consultation, two stages of consultation, uh, targeted consultation surveys or focus groups, public hearings, uh, just uh, paper submissions, all the different varieties of, of, uh, of processes for eliciting public con comment and, and input, uh, as well as the timing of it, there's always the question about, well, are, how well is it working? Uh, and and there's a couple of questions from the audience members that that lead us to uh, I think maybe consider what what are the the proper metrics. First of all, uh, is um, you know is there a, a denominator or a number a fraction that we're trying to look for uh, to know that there's been adequate public participation. Granted, as Christiana said, it's not a plebiscite necessarily, but on the other hand, if, as some research of mine shows, the modal number of comments uh, filed in rulemakings is zero in the US, uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, or as uh, uh, the, if you look at, uh, at the the median number of comments at a study that Steve Bala had been involved in and produced some years ago, it was about 12. Um, is that adequate? Uh, can, is there a relationship at all between the number, absolute number or proportion of possible interested uh, uh, members of the public to help us assess whether, whether we're doing well or, or or could be doing better in terms of fostering consultation? Christiana? Yeah, thanks, Kerry. That's a great question. We actually worked on that um, some time ago. So the work probably would need to be updated. Uh, and I think you also published a paper as, as part of this. So um, I'll put that into in the chat in a moment. Uh, we actually worked on a framework for regulatory policy evaluation. And one of the elements in there was on how to evaluate the, the effects of consultation on, on, on better regulations. Obviously, I mean, the holy grail is always experiments, but uh, that's sometimes feasible, sometimes it isn't. Um, I think if you look into it, and the framework gives us some ideas on indicators, both in, in terms of um, what's sometimes called uh, facts-based indicators, as well as, as, uh, as perceptions-based indicators. Now, I think following on your question, is this a good or bad things if you get comments or not, or no comments? I think with, like with all numbers, you can never interpret them uh, without the context. So I think that's important. It's uh, it, it's never a good idea just to use those numbers and say, okay, this is working, this is not working. You have to understand the, the, the context around it. So I think that's an important point you're making. You can interpret it to some numbers in both ways. Um, that's similar in other areas like corruption. Like if, if for instance, a lot of corruption ca cases are brought out into the light, does this mean there's a lot of corruption or does it mean actually that uh, the processes to discover them are working? You know, it's, a, it's a similar thing. Now, I'm quite a big fan also of perception data in that space and surveys and potentially sometimes they might need to be uh, in an anonymous way done. So if you ask civil servants, if you ask parliamentarians, are you actually getting any information? Are you using this information? Are you changing anything? And if not, what would need to change? If you ask those participating in the consultation processes, if you use techniques like the ones based on on measuring procedural fairness, for instance, as some examples you find in, in, in the paper with, uh, with Ellen Lind, I think you already get a pretty good idea of what's happening. Coming back to what I was saying, the evaluation part is important and you probably wanna embed all these numbers uh, in, in, uh, in, in both having measurements, but also having some qualitative work, which is being done, which should give you a pretty good picture of what's working, what's not. Um, yeah, so I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's important to see things into context. But again, coming back to the point I made before, the interesting thing is that very few countries seem to want to know. 
whether their consultation systems are working. Everyone emphasizes how important it is, but very few countries actually look into that, at least in a systematic way to find out whether, whether it's working. Um, now, as I said before, new technologies, well, they're not necessarily that new by now, but like artificial intelligence, et cetera. There are a lot of ways now, I think also to uh, both to help uh, with consultation systems. These tools can help in consultation systems, for instance, to process large amount of comments, but they can also help in the evaluation of consultation processes. I think there are a lot of techniques that we that we can use and that you don't find in the framework we have yet. I think that's work we will hopefully do in the future and uh, so that we can update that work. Um, I think that uh... A successful so of course I cannot uh, provide any uh, an answer detail and uh, with the skill uh, comp the skill comparable to Christian uh, what I, what I think is that uh, a successful uh, consultation process is the process which involve who are those directly indirectly and potentially um, impacted by uh, regulation. And so for this for this reason it's really pivotal to have a, a detail mapping activity so it's not a, a question of uh, numbers it's a question of uh, uh, to have all these uh, stakeholders represented i think that's a uh, that's a really perceptive point one could have 20 million comments that come in with just basically um, no real information or insight other than maybe people's preferences. At, uh, but on the other hand, you could have a process that involved one or two people who could actually give voice to concerns and provide information or, or, or more substance or detail uh, that might be more meaningful in the end than just um, hearing from a lot of people saying essentially nothing. We have a lot of other questions uh, that came in, on, in from the audience. Uh, one question, and, and I, maybe I'll, I'll just close with asking Christian quickly if you have any thoughts about this following on, um, you know, your, you know, your comments about indicators. Uh, one member of the audience wonders uh, if you have any thoughts uh, about how the World Bank's decision to terminate its doing business project uh, leaves us a little less informed about uh, how OECD best practices might actually translate into um, better regulation. Any thoughts uh, 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 on that? I mean, I suppose, oh, I would take the liberty of answering in, in one way is saying certainly anytime we have less information, we are less informed. Uh, about and have, have fewer opportunities to study and evaluate all aspects of, of uh, regulation. There's a lot of detail, I think, about the doing business project that um, we would have to get into to see whether it was actually all that meaningful or the, itself the best or even a, a good way of, of assessing the quality of a regulatory system. I don't know, Christiane, if you want to uh, add anything further on that. Yeah, I mean, just to say doing business, obviously, as you said, we could have a whole discussion on what it covers, what it what it doesn't cover. Um, yeah, I, I invite people just to have a look at what's still there in terms of indicators that they might not be familiar with. I mean, as, as I said, we had published in the Outlook the information on the indicators of regulatory policy and governance, so at least that gives already an idea to what extent countries actually try to make sure that their uh, that their regulation is based on evidence that there's consultation that there's that there's early late stage consultation process that there's actually an incorporation into the system of exposed evaluation so i think that already is uh, is obviously uh, quite relevant uh, and uh, at the OECD and i'm sure also at other organizations we have a lot of other indicators and obviously you can also debate again on any of those including the indicators of regulatory policy and governance and my colleagues are working on the product market regulation indicators there are a lot of other indicators you can always debate about what they cover and what they don't cover and then none of them is perfect i think that's inherent in any cross-country comparisons you have to simplify to some way you cannot cover everything that's where you do more in-depth work in, in in countries all right i'll come back to nicoletta for 
any closing comments that you have here at the very end. And with my apologies to audience members whose questions we didn't get to, we had questions about technology and AI. We had questions about whether uh, consultation is what we should be searching for, or should we be searching for consensus? Uh, of, of questions about selection bias and who comes forward and 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 makes comments or participates in, in in regulatory processes. Are they the people who are generally the ones who are unhappy, uh, or uh, uh, you know, and, and so forth? But but all of that's to say. Uh, this has been an enormously stimulating conversation. Nicoletta, you have uh, started us off with a, a tremendously important paper that raises tremendously important issues. And I'll give you the closing word for this session. Uh, thank you. It's not easy to close, but uh, I wanted, I would like to. to... Uh, to quote uh, your your words and your work, saying that uh, there is a need of uh, excellence in public administration, also in order to use in the in the best way these uh, new tools, uh, cognitive design, artificial intelligence, uh, all the better regulation tools uh, uh, need in order to be. Uh, implemented in a in a correct way uh, the, the, the uh, an excellence in public administration that is uh, far to be rich in many countries so the um, our task as a professor is to try to to improve this quality and the task of the OECD is to is always to to indicate uh, the path uh, uh, to go through so I thank you once again so much for this uh, occasion for discussion. Well, thank you uh, very much, Nicoletta. Thank you, Christiana, for being with us here today. It's a fitting way to close Nicoletta's comments about excellence, which is a journey. And for the last hour, you've helped us and all of those who've joined in this conversation along on that journey to think more deeply, more seriously about, and let me return to words from Nicoletta's paper, genuine and real public consultation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have this conversation and I'm glad uh, that you could join us for this uh, important dialogue. Uh, and uh, we look forward uh, to future conversations and you you can also find the video of this uh, presentation on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much for joining us today. Have a good rest of your day.